from Abuja. Hello, thank you for being a part of our show. We appreciate you. I'm Magnus Paco, and this is Magnus Paco GVA. As you know, it's all about how we can raise the level of living. That's what it's all about. In view today, foreign policy in an era of sharp nationalism, has President Trump's international disposition ignited a new spirit of sharp nationalism among the major economic powers of the world? How will foreign policy in Nigeria, or for that matter, in other African countries adapt to any new sharp nationalism in the major economies of the world? We have with us the right person to answer these questions. We have the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mr. Jeffrey Onyema. But before that, in our hidden economics, macho man politics. Now, up next in our quick view, we rank the friendliest countries. That's coming right up. The World Economic Forum recently provided a ranking of countries by the friendliness of its people to foreign visitors. The ranking is listed in the Forum's Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Report, which gives scores on a scale from 1, where locals made foreign visitors feel very unwelcome, to 7, for very welcome. In this connection, in which of the following countries are the people most friendly to visiting foreigners? France, United States, Iceland, and New Zealand. In which of the following African countries are the people the friendliest to foreign visitors? Burkina Faso, Morocco, Senegal and Mali. Stay with us for our answers coming up shortly. Still in view, Jeffrey Oyema, Foreign Minister of Nigeria, on the policy options for any new sharp nationalism across the world. But up next in our hidden economics, match a man politics. It wasn't long ago that President Barack Obama said that what was important was not strong men, but strong institutions. Well, according to The Economist magazine, across the world, from Russia to China, and from India to Egypt, macho leadership is back in fashion. Clearly, the champion in terms of this new macho style leadership is President Vladimir Putin who has taken this style of politics and leadership to almost comical lengths by posing bare-chested with a gun and also while working out in the gym. As The Economist magazine has said, President Putin has also done well in forging personal relations with fellow tough guys such as President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Egypt whom he presented with a wood-handled Kalashnikov. Mr. Putin has also taken to President Jacob Zuma in South Africa and Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary. And as The Economist magazine also said, 
The taste for macho leadership seems to have also spread to Asia, where the three biggest powers, China, Japan and India, are now all led by charismatic nationalists who have made a point of their decisive approach and their willingness to take tough decisions at home while facing down foreigners overseas. Xi Jinping in China, Shinzo Abe in Japan, and Narendra Modi in India. These leaders have all replaced leaders who had a lower key and more collective mode of leadership. Now others like Marine Le Pen are talking tough and suggesting that to get the best economic gains for your country, you need to be a macho man politician. Can this work in Nigeria and across Africa? Macho man politics. Our hidden economics for you. Macho, macho, macho Surprisingly, the United States of America, well known for its people telling visitors to have a nice day, ranks at a distant number 102. France ranks at number 80. The United Kingdom comes out better at number 55 in friendliness to visitors. And so, frigid cold Iceland ranks number one in the world in its people's friendliness to visitors. In Africa, Morocco is number one and ranks number three in the world in the people's friendliness to visiting foreigners. For comments, adverts, and sponsorship, please see our information displayed on the screen. Nigeria is the so-called giant of Africa. Now, many nations around the world have elected people that are posturing like giants in their macho man politics and leadership style. Leading the world in all of this at this time is the newly elected president of the United States, who has been unafraid to take on domestic or foreign leaders and critics. He has said that his administration was going to be driven by what he has described as an America first orientation. What does America first mean? Are we now looking at an attempt to trim down globalization and multilateralism? Has the time come to one up our neighbors and win at all costs over other countries? How should Nigeria and other African countries engage this seeming new global experience? Jeffrey Oyama is Nigeria's very highly educated and cerebral foreign minister. He is here to address these issues. Please join us in our discussion with Mr. Jeffrey Oyama. Okay, thank you, uh, Minister. We are very pleased that you are here in our studios, uh, Magoni Studios. Very happy to see you. You're doing a wonderful job. We're proud of you. Thank you very much. Yes. So now today we want to talk about uh, this so-called new era of nationalism. Champion, it seems, by the new president of the United States, President Trump. Um, does this mean now that we've come or we're going to the end of globalization, the end of multilateralism, and how can Nigeria and other African countries uh, figure in this kind of arrangement, in this so-called new era of nationalism? Uh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, it's good to be here um, with you. Well, um, new era of nationalism. Um, well, I think first of all, I'm not sure to what extent you can really say it's new to start with. Um, you know, for a long time, you've had in a lot of these countries a, um, a right-wing fringe 
that um, sort of espouses some extreme nationalist uh, views. You know, in the UK, the National Front has been there in France and you know, in, all, in all the countries, uh, Germany included. But I suppose the point you're making is that in the past, they've tended to um, remain almost fringe, um, you know, parties sure. and with not much likelihood of coming into power. And now it appears that, you know, um, they have um, a greater chance of, of um, coming into power. Well, how does that affect globalization per se? I think it still remains to be seen because, you know, when you look at it, um, you know, Marie Le Pen is not the president of France. And um, but you know, it could be. Yeah, her father could have been too. Don't forget, her father was, you know, in the final rounds and knocked out, the, um, you know, the socialist candidates some years back. Mm. Um, we've seen in Austria they step back from the brink, you know, um, and, and and so forth. So, I don't know if we can still um, call it a new era. We still, I think, the jury of obviously it's still early days yeah. to judge uh, Trump and to see exactly where he's at. He said so many things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But assuming that they all came into power, yeah. um, I think the globalization cannot be rolled back. You know, um, There might be certain policies, maybe more protectionism um, to a certain extent. But I think just because of, um, you know, um, the global communications architecture of the world today, um, that um, it's, you know, it's going to be difficult to really roll back uh, globalization. Okay. Well, what about the, when, when the Trump administration seems to be uh, suspicious of, say, the United Nations? Um, on on a number of positions, you know, is, does that not suggest maybe a negative look at multilateralism, and and therefore we might not listen to what the United Nations says, which is going to do what we want to do. <laughs> well, you know, actually, it's nothing that new. The U.S. has always been rather uh, suspicious yeah. of uh, the UN and multi uh, multilateralism. They pulled out of uh, UNESCO. Uh, you know, they pulled out of um, uh, uh, UNIDO, um, you know, and I think FAO, they're now, you know, they were threatening to um, to pull out. You recall that um, there are periods where they, you know, refused to pay the, their contributions to a number of uh, UN agencies. And also for a long time, um, even with the UN proper, um, you know, they've always sort of... Um, not always been the greatest multilateralist. Mm. So to that extent, it's nothing that new, mm. you know. Um, so, um, of course, the, the, the person that's been um, appointed as their um, permanent representative yeah. uh, to the UN, um, you know, is somebody that um, uh, we feel um, buys into multilateralism. Yeah, it would appear so. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was surprised that she was named uh, exactly. to be the, 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 yeah, yeah, the yeah. United Nations. Yeah. Okay, so then, um, but when, when Donald Trump says America first, how, how is that in terms of foreign policy? You, know, you guys have your language that you use. Well, what, what does that mean to say America first? Well, what does that mean? I mean, wasn't, I mean if, you're, if you're the president of a country, obviously it's your country first. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. but, but the guy comes out and says it boldly, <clears throat> America first. Does, does that mean anything? I think it does, yes. Because yeah. um, you, know, you had the United States pre-Second World War mm -hmm. um, when it was, the U.S. was much more inward looking. And in fact, at the outbreak, um, I mean, when things were really getting uh, uh, hot at the outbreak of the Second World War, the U.S. was actually neutral uh, to start with, and it was only when you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese that they now came off the, um, you know, um, the neutral uh, position. Um, but then, post um, Second World War, they were much more engaged because, of course, you had the Cold War, 
And um, for the Americans, it was an existential threat to the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And so they were obliged, more or less, uh, to save, as they saw it, uh, the Western world uh, and um, and the world as they wanted to see it, they were obliged to be interventionist in the world. Mm-hmm. Then um, at that time also, they, um, they were the greatest economic power the world had ever seen. Mm-hmm. After the Cold War, um, you no longer have, you know, that existential threat for them. Mm-hmm. And um, so they feel that, uh, I would imagine, uh, well, Trump certainly, um, that we don't need to be paying all that money uh, to protect Japan, um, South Korea, um, and even the NATO countries. These countries have become economic powerhouses, yeah. and they should be paying, you know, contributing much yeah. more. Yeah. And um, so we shouldn't be the world's policemen. And let's focus on, um, you know, our uh, the, the the rednecks or whatever you want to yeah. call them, working in uh, the Midwestern uh, yeah. U.S. countries. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, states that have lost their jobs. Um, you know, let's let's work. But, but, to, but once to you that. lose leverage over Japan, over South Korea, over say even the Philippines, if you were so detached and thought that right, they should carry their own burden. You know, it's a cost-benefit thing. You know, you you weigh the 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 the, the pros and the cons, uh, the the costs and the benefits, mm. and um, and you take your decision. Mm. And um, and obviously, the you know, if they're going that route, it's because they feel that um, you know the those countries are well into the democratic capitalist orbit. Mm. And um, they, they would go, not they represent, else, yes, yeah. a threat because you yeah. know the the, the the Soviet Union has collapsed. Mm-hmm. You know, Russia itself is now uh, probably extreme capitalist, mm-hmm. and, um, and and so for them, I think they probably do not see you know major threats coming. Because when I when I when I was looking at America first, when I'm looking at that statement. I wasn't sure, I didn't know what, it, what foreign policy implications were there, but I thought the man was speaking to his people. He was speaking to citizens of the United States, you know, the, mm-hmm. the blue collar workers, for example, mm-hmm. to say, hey, I want you guys to see me as somebody that, that's looking out for you, and yeah. that's what it is. And I didn't know if there was any good information there for foreign policy purposes. Well, he came out and yeah. said, he, he said um, uh, uh, plainly, directly, that uh, countries like Japan yeah. will have to be responsible yeah. for their own yeah, protection right. and that yeah. NATO right. um, will have to be, you know, so he was very clear about that. Right. Yeah. right. So, so come home to Nigeria in all of this. Has that meant anything? You know, have you guys then come back and said, okay, it looks like something is happening here. We've got Putin. Putin himself is also very nationalistic. When I say nationalistic, I'm even thinking in terms of sharp nationalism, where, mm-hmm. you know, really I want to assert myself. Mm-hmm. He's almost like a macho man. Mm-hmm. Trump is a macho man. We've got a lot of macho men <laughs> leaders now around the world. So in, in Nigeria, and Nigeria being a leader in Africa, you foreign minister, it, 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 are you going back to the drawing board to say, okay, let's reassess what our foreign policy um, uh, 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 disposition would look like in light of all of these? Um, well, no, I wouldn't say we've gone back to the drawing board, yeah. um, at least not yet, yeah. um, because um, we, as has often been said, campaign rhetoric is one thing, yeah. and then actual governance is another thing. Yeah. You know, so we cannot uh, formulate our foreign policy, you know, on the basis of uh, uh, campaign rhetoric. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, secondly, um, you know, Trump reached out to our president uh, three, four days ago, yeah. and um, so for us, that was a very good uh, signal. And um, you know, he was very complimentary about our president and um, was expressed support yeah. for a lot of the initiatives, especially in the security areas yeah. and anti-corruption, you know. And um, so that was a real 
um, confidence building call, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we have to react on the basis of you know facts and realities. Okay. You know, and the reality is that they've reached out to us. Uh, it's uh, invited our president to the U.S. Yeah. So, you know, the signals are there um, as um, clearly um, somebody that we can do business with. Yeah. With the start of President Trump's administration, have we entered a new era of sharp nationalism? Especially as it appears, many politicians in other countries are attempting to follow after Mr. Trump's extremely bold and no-nonsense style of campaigning and leadership. Some people see Mr. Trump's style as being nationalistic, especially as he says he believes in an America first political and economic formation. I believe most people are nationalistic and indeed want the interests of their country to come first. I don't see anything wrong with Mr. Trump's America first. What should he want? America last or second? What I believe is different is that Mr. Trump is taking a macho man approach to achieving his objectives for his country. He was elected because he campaigned on this platform. Therefore, this is probably what Americans want at this time. That is, a strong leader. Until now, the Western world had resisted the trend of strong man politics. Barack Obama, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande, and David Cameron have been typically seen as proponents of multilateralism and globalization that look for how countries could pursue big global agendas. However, contrast these leaders with President Donald Trump, who has been brash, self-confident, and not unwilling to offend if necessary. I believe that Nigeria, as a developing country, has to come up with an economic profile that makes it attractive and strong. Attractive because it must look like a worthy trading partner that offers what other countries need, regardless of how sharp their nationalism is. And then strong because it should not be seen as dependent and ready to look for financial aid. This is where a foreign policy based on economic diplomacy is necessary. In this, Nigeria and other African countries will look to produce goods and services that citizens of other countries need and will buy. It seems useful, and perhaps more than ever before, for African countries to improve on their governance structures and cut waste with a view to transforming their economies with better infrastructure that can promote intra-African trade. Economic strength in Nigeria and across Africa is what will enable Nigeria and Africa to do business boldly with the world. The world is changing. Perhaps what a country needs after all is not just strong institutions, but also a strong leader. I'm Magnus Paco, and that's my view. Oh, oh, oh.